It's a joy and privilege this morning to be with you. Um, I'm very excited uh, to be a part of this. I've gotten to know a lot of the brothers at the Canadian Reform Seminary over the years, and also some of the professors there. Arian's a good friend of mine. Uh, We often sit down for coffee and compare notes. Uh, We're in this process together, learning about missions, learning how to be effective witnesses. This morning, I'm going to be speaking on this theme, learning from our past, uh, and specifically the proposed URCNA Missions Plan 2020. Now, Arian, about a year ago, talked to me about this, and he said, would you be willing to speak on this plan? Um, I know that your synod has mandated this to your committee. At the time, it seemed like a great idea because I figured we'd have it all figured out by now. One key word here, proposed, proposed. This is what we're taking to, uh, to our, our missions committee meeting uh, where we're going to be sitting down. This is a, a plan that we have put together as a committee. We have now asked for advice from our churches, from our missionaries, from our former missionaries. We're receiving that advice now. This probably will be modified, just so you know. But this is the idea, this is the general direction that we would like to go as a federation. I want to begin by reading from Ephesians 6.12, a well-known verse. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. And brothers and sisters, I don't know how many of you have served in the Canadian Armed Forces or perhaps in the U.S. Army. But one thing you know when you go to war, it's, it's essential to work together. When you're called to fight, there's a few things you need to know. Number one, who is your enemy? Number two, you need to know who's fighting beside you. And you need to know what the battle is about. And as a church, we know that we have an enemy. His name is Satan. We know that the spiritual forces, the powers of this dark world... This is a reality that we are fighting. We've seen this earlier this week when we talked about witchcraft. Fascinating. Something we saw as missionaries, we see in, as missionaries in Mexico. But the reality is we are fighting against spiritual forces. So what we're talking about here is organization as a church. This is not just a side issue. This is important. How do we fight? How do we work together? How do we come alongside each other to be effective in our witness for Jesus Christ? And I want to begin where we were. Give you a little history. We come out of the CRC. You know that. We've been about 25 plus years out of the CRC. What were some of the current concerns that we had? Well, there was very much in the CRC, there was a a top-heavy, a bureaucratic approach to missions. Um, As we left the CRC, we were very glad to, to leave that bureaucracy behind. There were different elements to this. First of all, it was not a a field driven approach. What do we mean by a a field driven approach? Well, one where missionaries actually have a say in what they're doing. Sometimes what was happening is that there was a division between those who were managing the missions and those who were actually on the field. There was resentment there between missionaries and committees. There there was also a, a separation between local church and missionaries. So the board sent missionaries to the field. Sometimes it was officially through the local church, but the reality was they worked for a board. They didn't work together with the local church. Sometimes that separation was felt keenly. Missionaries didn't know their home churches. Home churches didn't know their missionaries. Another great concern was that money equals power. We know that the way things are Uh, The way money is used on a field is very important. How is money to be used properly? In the CRC model, very much, there were a few on the top who had too much control. So 
there was this bureaucracy, there were these on top who were making decisions for the missionaries. A lot of these things we wanted to get away from. But this last point really is the most important, and that is the core problem in our model was liberalism. Many of the basic doctrines that we believed in were being undercut and undermined. This was a, a great concern to many of us who left. That was my parents, that wasn't myself. I was 18 at the time, 17 at the time. But the authority of God's word, women in office, some of these key um, doctrines were very much, especially on the missional side of things, were not held to, were not believed in. So when we left the CRC, what happened? What's happened over the last 25 years? Well, we were able to leave, walk away from that bureaucracy, leave that structure that we had in the past. We were, to, we're, we were able to uh, send missionaries locally, which was something that we saw as a very positive thing. Local men being sent by their home churches, both domestically and on the foreign field. Former missionaries that worked for the CRC were then taken in. They were uh, received as URC missionaries. They were sent out again by local churches. Local churches that couldn't afford to support a man on their own, what were they able to do? Well, they were able to ask for help. We formed something called JVCs, Joint Venture Committees, where uh, different churches were able to come together and support one man. So as we assess the last 25 years, we can say that a lot of excellent work has been done, a lot of grassroots work has been done. Um, I don't know how many of you have seen the copy of the URCNA prayer map, something that we put together um, in the last few years with all of our missionaries on it, but we have a lot of men serving there. I have a number of copies here. If anybody would like a copy, feel free to take it. Uh, this has been a, a great prayer tool for our churches. But again, we've, we've seen a lot of blessings over the last 25 years. So the question is, why change? Do we need to change? Is it necessary to change? And here are some of the things that, some of the issues that we have seen over the last few years. And the first is one man getting sent to one field does not allow for teams to be built. Why is teamwork important? We've sent a couple of men to large cities, one Washington, D.C. He's been there for many years alone. A lot of our men feel that aloneness, that separateness from other churches. A lot of times there's no other churches in the area. Being in a place by yourself, working by yourself, is not an easy thing long term. That's true, especially on the foreign field. A lot of the countries we've been working in, seven or eight countries over the last uh, five years, and a lot of those places we were sending one man to one field. When Matt Van Dyken came to take over for myself, it was great to have him for two and a half years to work by my side. It, it was wonderful to have that teamwork. Uh, that's something that, that um, some of you are, are experiencing in, in Brampton, for example. Wonderful to see how Eric Underwater is now being used to come alongside our brother and, and just to, to, to work together as a team, there's something wonderful about having that teamwork. One church overseeing entire foreign fields is difficult. That's true on the domestic side to a degree. But especially on the foreign fields, this is something that we're seeing. It begins with the, the vetting process. How do we do that? How do we find men who are capable and suitable for the field? Both of those things, they're two separate things. The logistics of sending a man to the field, how do you train him in language? What's the best way? What happens when his children grow up and need to go to university? How do you deal with that? What happens if a missionary gets sick on the field and needs to come home and you have one man on the field and no one to take his place? What happens when violence breaks out and a man needs to be removed from a field? That's a reality. That was something we faced in Mexico. 
All of those things are, are very complex questions. Anybody who's been involved in missions, all of our missionaries here, they, they know what that's about. These are, are big things, especially when you're there alone and you're looking for help. Another question that we've been facing the last few years is how do we open new foreign and domestic fields? Who does the research and logistical work? One thing that we're seeing in a lot of our classes is that we don't have a vision for reaching our communities. We don't have a vision for planting churches. Something that I mentioned yesterday is that a healthy church is a planting church. What we do at home is something that we want to take to the foreign field and take to the domestic field. But who's standing back and who's taking a look? Where are the places that we could potentially plant? A lot of times, local churches are overwhelmed. They're swamped by the things that are going on in their own churches. They can't begin to think big picture. How do we close fields? Something that we've dealt with over the last few years. We've had a couple of fields that have closed. Oftentimes, that has been rather suddenly. Um, local church for whatever reason, sees the need to close a field, a man needs to come off the field. What is the right and proper way, both for the missionary, but also for the field itself? The people that you've been working with, the people that you've promised, uh, where you've promised to plant a church, how do you do that in a proper and right way? Missionaries on furlough, who will replace them? Something that we're facing right now as Matt comes back, is, is back right now on furlough. Um, I'm going to be going down for 10 weeks coming up this winter. We have other people that are able to fill in. A lot of places, that's not the reality, especially when it's a foreign language. How do you do that? What's the best way? And if you don't have a team approach, it's very difficult to do this. Retiring missionaries, how do we help them come off the field? Who will help them get reestablished and settled. Again, when it's all local, it's difficult to do. This next point may be very well the most important. How do our young people get trained for missions and serve? One of the things that we're seeing right now is that in Reformed churches, I know I've talked to a lot of the Canadian Reformed pastors and in this area, um, and also a lot of our URC men in some of the, 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 the big cities. A lot of our churches are suffering. A lot of our, our young families are leaving. Um, a lot of the reason that they're, they're leaving is because they're, they're born-again Christians, those who have been raised well, who know and love the gospel, yet they want to serve. They want to serve. They feel that in our churches, we are not able to put them to work. I get this all the time as missions coordinator. Young people talk to me. They say, Rich, how can I go to the field? I, wanna, I got a gap year. I got a university year. I want to go. How can I serve uh, in URC churches, in Canadian Reformed churches? How, how can I serve? I want an experience. I'm thinking maybe the Lord's calling me into missions. It breaks my heart to see a lot of our young people leaving. It's major brain drain, um, major outsourcing. So we're sending our people to other organizations oftentimes because we don't have this built in. We, don't, we haven't thought about this ourselves. I know this past year of a couple of, 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 of our young people who have gone to a CRC mission. Why? Because they're putting them to work. One of our... Uh, former pastors, uh, one of our pastors who passed away a number of years ago, his son, I just spoke with him a few days ago, and he mentioned to me that he's going to another denomination because he wants to get into missions and church planting, and he sees that they have on-ramps for him to get there. So this is, for me, a, a, a real big question. How do we use the 55-plus crowd who would like to serve Brothers and sisters, if there is an unused section of our, uh, of our congregations, I believe it's this particular group. A lot of guys, I turned 50 this year, a lot of guys who I know in their 50s have, have um, made it in business. A lot of guys have businesses that have done well, they have money that is sitting in the bank, 
they would love to be used in missions in some way. Again, a lot of them are now going to World Renew. They're going to other organizations that are using them and their gifts. I would love to see that used again in our own circles. How do we do that? So here are just a number of things. Why change? These are some of the organizational things that we need to be thinking about as a church. So we've come up with a, a number of proposals that we think are going to help. Again, these are still debatable, still things we're talking about, still things we're getting feedback on. First of all, two committees, foreign and domestic. Right now we have one big committee, 16 members, two from each classes. We would like to see this committee divided. Why? First of all, planting churches at home and abroad, it's very different. Two different animals, two different ways of going about it, two things that are, are very distinct. And even in foreign missions, anybody who's, who knows foreign missions knows well that it's very important to understand there's a cultural context in which you're working wherever you go. Even in that, it's important to realize the differences. But to have a, a game plan, to have people thinking about it, Secondly, committees would be compromised, would be comprised, comprised of men who have knowledge, experience, and passion. This is one of the things that we have gleaned from the OPC. I was at their General Assembly a couple of years ago, and as they um, were debating who should be on their committee, they have these committees long form, but they have ways of going on that committee and coming off that committee. And when there were two spots available, they gave presentations on the floor of General Assembly of men who they thought should serve. And these men had a list of credentials that was unbelievably long. I felt like a novice when I looked at what these guys had done. Great experience, great guys on that committee. And in the URC, that's exactly what we want. We want our former missionaries, we want the guys who know things about foreign missions to be on that committee to help our guys and to help plant churches on the foreign field. And we want the same to be true on the domestic side. By having two committees, it would allow the URCNA to form separate strategies, both at home and on the foreign field. Two committees with eight members meet each, uh, eight members each, one representative from each classes. Again, we want to have proper representation. We want guys that are representing well their classes, that their classes believe in. Proposal number two, co two coordinators. The big question is, what would the coordinators do? Do we really need two coordinators at all? First of all, their job would be, as mine is, to, to visit, to help, and encourage uh, missionaries. This is something that's super important for us, for encouragement, um, just to connect us. Secondly, or thirdly, to create and distribute information to churches about current work, something that I'm already doing. Um, again, this is something that could be greatly expanded. We're seeing with um, technology today, that's not my forte. I'd love to see, to have younger help who could be on Twitter, who could be on different venues where these things could be publicized and we could bring in our, our young people. Part of the role of the coordinators would be to work specifically on helping the committees identify new fields. Again, manpower is a huge thing. We don't have the time to always to invest in it, but to think through where we're going to plant next is really important. One of the things that the OPC has is that they have uh, regional home missionaries that are men in different classes that are there specifically to work with the guys that are on the field to identify places where they could plant next. As a URC, we have about 12 or 13 domestic fields right now, domestic church plants right now. The OPC has 40 plus. They're doing four or five times the amount that we are doing. So we look at them, they're about the same size as us. We're thinking, okay, we could do a lot more. Uh, we have a lot of people who would like to serve. We have a, a lot of people who would like to give. What is lacking? It's, organization that's lacking. 
again to the practical side, to find, to vet, to train, to coach missionaries. One of the things that is really exciting in the PCA is that they have a, a way to coach guys. New, new church planters need a lot of help. I know I, I needed a lot of help. But to have somebody set aside that can come alongside them and give them advice and, and help them out, and if they have a project they're working on, that that coordinator can be there to help them. One of the things that we're working on is a, a missionary training institute or a missionary training internship, which is very normal in, in a lot of other Reformed denominations. But we would love to have money that would be set aside so that guys who are interested in missions immediately after seminary could go and serve with one of our missionaries. Um, we have a, a great brother, uh, Paul Murphy, in New York City, who's doing a fantastic work, uh, non-Dutch, uh, has a great testimony. Anybody who, who knows him knows he's a big personality, loves the Lord, but he, he has a passion for training young men. He's uh, in his mid-60s now. Uh, we'd love to see him used. He's excited about having guys come and serve with him in New York City. We would also love to see, so on the domestic side, we would love to see the domestic coordinator to, to pick that up and work with our committees and work with people in our denomination on that. On, on the foreign side, we'd love to see something like STS started, which was a short-term, eight-week program that the CRC had for training of foreign missionaries. A lot of our men, like Bill Green, uh, were involved in that at, at the early stages when they were coming out of college or coming out of seminary. And it was uh, an intense time of instruction for about two or three weeks. And then they actually took them to the foreign field and they, were, they would have a boot camp there and then they would actually go out and do mission work, give them language training. A number of our guys speak very highly of that. We'd love to see something like this get started. So these are some of the ideas that we have behind the two coordinators. Um, Incidentally, the OPC has four coordinators. They have two domestic and two foreign. Uh, and that's in addition to their various, I believe they have eight men on the domestic field serving as regional home missionaries. The third proposal, I don't know how many of you read it. You think you have it in your packets if you want to follow along. But the third um, is classical subcommittees. So what we see happening is kind of an expansion of what we already have. We have this JVC model, Joint Venture Committee, where two or three churches are working together. We see this being expanded slightly to more of a, a classical model, um, where classes really takes charge of their own mission work. So they have the vision for domestic, they have the, domestic, uh, the vision for foreign, and we're even suggesting the idea of we, we're working in, in eight countries, seven or eight countries, that each classes on the foreign field takes the vision for one particular area in the world and that they run with it, that they look for new missionaries, that they send new missionaries to that place. So classical subcommittees, domestic and foreign committees would have reps from classes, missionaries, the missionaries in the classes, one rep from sending churches and reps from federa the Federational Missions Committee. So we would continue with the, the model we like very much, that local church would continue to send, call, and oversee life and doctrine, uh, the, local, uh, the local missionary, that he would have, they would have a, a real connection, that, that kind of relationship would continue to be there, that we don't lose that kind of grassroots, uh, homegrown model, we love that. But then that the local church would not have full representation or would not have full responsibility, rather, of that missionary all on their own plate. They would have a, a representative on the committee. The missionary himself would be on the committee, uh, but it wouldn't be their full responsibility. These committees would then provide administrative oversight to missionaries and potentially replace classical missions committees and JVCs. We see this kind of bringing things together so that we have the foreign committee, the domestic committee, and the federational committee would be made up of those members, but everyone would be working together. You've perhaps heard the joke that the call of 
the gospel is not to make disciples, uh, not to make committees of all nations. Uh, I think sometimes as a Reformed churches, we, we do that. We have a lot of committees. One of the things that we're hoping is that um, we'll have less committees, but more people connected to our missionaries so that we'll be able to work more effectively. So subcommittees would meet quarterly uh, via web. They would conduct field visits. They would resolve conflicts. Um, this is one of the things that we would like to see where missionaries have input from the get-go so that they're not, uh, decisions are not made about them um, by those above them, uh, but that they would have uh, direct communication with those who are working with them, more of a, a team mentality. And again, we would see this as most of the groundwork would take place in subcommittees. Uh, most of the responsibility would be with the subcommittees. And again, we would love to see our missions to continue to be field-driven, uh, not the top-down approach, something, uh, again, that we really want to fight against. Proposal number four, this is a big one. This is a controversial one, uh, to have a federational missions fund. This is something that scares a lot of people still, and we understand that. Um, but we feel that we're right now being handicapped by our lack of ability to receive funds and to use funds for missional purposes. One of the things that we've, I've heard again and again, I had one man come to me uh, a couple of years ago and he said, Rich, I've, I've been very blessed by the Lord. I would like to give 10% of my net worth right now to the church. I don't want to give it to local works and spread it out. I would like to give it right now to URCNA missions. How can I do that? We have no way right now of receiving any kind of money in that form. So individuals, estates, um, Organizations like Word and Deed, they've tapped into this. Great idea. A lot of older people would love to give in their estate, in their will, uh, give to something like um, a, a, a federation-wide fund. What would this money be used for? First of all, for needy mission works. At the end of the year, oftentimes our mission works have needs. We would like to see that they could tap into this. Um, internships, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, this is something we would just like to be a given uh, for domestic church planting, for foreign church planting. Uh, training of missionaries, one of the things that most of the um, reformed denominations do is to send their foreign guys to the Missionary Training Institute, which is in Colorado, Missionary Training International, which is a one-month course. Uh, it's quite expensive. Where does a local church get funding for that? Some have failed to do that because funding was so high. Field exploration. Um, another thing that this fund would be used for. Uh, startup money for sending churches. So if a, a classist would like to plant a church locally or if they would like to plant a church on one of the fields in which we're already working, this would give them the kickstart money where they could initially begin. But again, we would like to see funding stay through the local church. That would be declining over time. Money could be received for the mission's coordinators, uh, also for retired missionaries. Right now we don't have any kind of a solution for retired missionaries that need money. All of these things would be great things that people could give to and earmark it towards. The STS program, another excellent way uh, that uh, one of the, uh, the summer program that we would like to start. How would this money be managed? That's the, the big question we have right now. What's the best way to manage that? We have not figured that out. That's something we're going to be working through. Personally, I would love to see it to be classically managed so that classical money would be used for classical works. But full accountability would be given to the churches, um, trying to avoid the mistakes of the past, not giving too much power to too few people, but to make sure that this money is used wisely and properly and that all can see clearly how it's being used. 
going to go a little more quickly. Change in church order. This is the final proposal. We'd like to add this clause to Article 47, the highlighted clause, the church's mission calling. The church's missionary task is to preach the word of God to the unconverted. When this task is to be performed beyond the field of an organized church, it is to be carried out by ministers of the word set apart to this labor who are called, supported, and supervised by their consistories. A local consistory shall seek the concurring advice before sending a missionary or removing one from a field. The churches should assist each other in the support of their missionaries. Not a big addition, but an important one. Again, we've had a few works that have been shut down a little bit quickly. More classical involvement, we think, would be a good idea. So the question is, how will this plan help us? We believe, number one, that this plan will help us start new mission works. Because so much is involved in starting new mission works, local churches often hesitate to take this upon themselves. We have one classes right now that would like to send more men. They have actually a big fund. Someone donated a lot of money to them, yet they're unable to send missionaries because there's no local churches that are able to think about or wrapping their minds around starting a new work. We think this is going to help us in in starting new mission works. Number two, this plan will relieve consistories of the burden of providing soul oversight. Um, Again, a lot of our churches have felt overwhelmed with time. Maybe not at the outset, maybe not in the first five or ten years even, but 15 years later, 20 years later, when your consistory has changed or your church has gotten a lot smaller, what happens? Suddenly there's less people who have more responsibility and that's more of a weight. Number three, this new plan will broaden accountability and support in missions while retaining more intimate relationships between missionaries and their sending churches. And this is something that we've actually been warned against by other Napark churches, even the OPC. They say, don't lose that relationship between local and missionary. Local church and missionary, that is essential uh, to keep. So we want to, again, focus on this and keep it very local. But again, we, we, we say this, we have learned also that we handicap ourselves by keeping all oversight and responsibility in a single consistory. The team approach that we propose should greatly enhance our Federation's vision, direction, and cooperation in missions. Number four, this plan will allow missions to be field-driven by giving missionaries an active voice in subcommittees. Again, having men who know the field that they're working in, talking about where we should plant next, how we can bring new guys on, how we can train and help the new guys that do come on. Um, Again, more of a team approach. Number five, this new plan will attract men interested in serving in URCNA missions. Something that I've already talked about. We've seen a lot of men go to other places uh, who would love to be involved in missions. Uh, When I go to seminaries and I talk with seminary students, the first thing they want to know, they ask me, Rich, how do I become a URCNA missionary? Right now, we don't have a lot of on-ramps to get on the highway, to get on uh, the road to the mission field. Um, One of the things that I've said to my committee many times is that you just don't have to convince a young man that he should go to the field. You especially have to convince his wife. She needs to know. She wants to know where she's going to live. She wants to know how she's going to be paid. She wants to know all of the ins and outs of what that calling looks like for her and her family. That's fair. That's good. So we would love to see more men come into missions, as already has been mentioned uh, this week. Um, It's slim pickings right now. Uh, There's a lot of churches in the URC that don't have men. Um, I think it's 15 churches at least Uh, that don't have, that we have vacant. Um, And also, as we look at our our own uh, mission fields, a lot of our men are getting older. How do we replace them? So this is essential uh, to think about. Uh, How are we going to attract new men to the field? I want to close with this. John 17 words, again, that we know well. 
I am coming to you now, Jesus said, but I say these things while I am still in the world so that they may have the full measure of my joy within them. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, for they are not of the world any more than I am of the world. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of it, but sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world, for I sanctify myself that they too may be truly sanctified. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I'd like to ask that you pray for us right now as we consider this as a federation. Pray that this plan will bring us together, whatever plan we finalize, will bring us together as a church, not divide us. We don't want to move forward. We don't want to get ahead of the Lord. But at the same time, we understand that some change is necessary. I'd like to ask that you would pray also for our Reformed churches, that we would truly have this vision of unity. I said at the outset that I've, it's been a joy for me to get to know uh, some of you brothers. And I am convinced that as faithful Reformed churches, we are just a, a small drop in the bucket in what God is doing in the world. A missionary, as a missionary, you see that very quickly. Um, you see God's working way beyond just the Reformed churches. But at the same time, our conviction is that this is what God, God's Word teaches. This is the way we ought to present the gospel. And brothers and sisters, there's very, there are very few of us, and we need to work together in this. We might not be under the same umbrella right now. We might not be able to uh, join federations right now, but my prayer is that we're going to be able to do this on a maybe in more of an informal level. Right now we're talking about possible, possibly working together in Mexico. I'd love to see that happen. Uh, one of our men just was sent from the URC to work in Uganda with the OPC team. Very exciting. But these kind of bonds, this kind of unity that we do truly enjoy, I think we need to grow in this and we need to pray that God would truly bless us in this. Because we are, again, in this spiritual battle and we need each other. This is not optional. We need to stand and fight together as God's people, as God's church, against the forces of Satan and darkness to bring the light of the gospel. May we do that together, brothers and sisters.